Good afternoon and happy Wednesday to you. Uh, just a couple more days and we will be to the weekend. Uh, we're going to go over a number of things, a number of cases and uh, um, very little case law. There will be a case law update given by uh, John Kamen uh, next month and I strongly recommend it. He is quite an expert in that arena and there's there are quite a few changes uh, in the law that are well worth knowing about. But let's get straight into uh, the city of Jackson, the Wright case, uh, the Rice case, rather. Um, apportionment just gets better and better. Uh, with the passage of SB, 8, uh, SB 899, April 19th of 2004, we got the new Labor Code Section 4663 and 4664 providing us the new apportionment standards. And um, those have been um, made stronger and stronger over this many years, or 14 years. Here's a great example. Uh, Mr. Rice had a neck CT and the uh, QME found degenerative disc disease in this 29-year-old, which is rather strange. Uh, he's awfully young for that. A portion to 25% to the employer, 25% to prior work, 25% to personal activities, and 25% to genetics. Now, the next exam, the uh, QME did a little research, research that the defense was very happy about, and found it was only 17% the employer. 17% prior work, and more importantly, 49% genetics. The, uh, the, the applicant's attorney made a mistake. Uh, he asked for a supplemental report, a third, a third report, and the QME took a look and did some more, looked at some more studies and argues, um, and articles and found that her, her uh, genes and heritability actually put it at in up, upwards of over 73% for all regions of the spine. The WCJ said that's not substantial evidence. You can't be um, apportioning to genetics. And the WCAB agreed in their panel decision. The court of appeal, they said genetics, uh, if we apportion to genetics, that would open the door to apportionment to impermissible immutable factors. Now, I'm not exactly certain what impermissible immutable factors they were referring to, but let's just suffice to say it's sufficient to say that they thought genetics was a bad thing or apportioning to genetics is a bad thing. Well, the, w the District Court of Appeals said, wrong. Uh, we can apportion, apportion to genetics. That looks good to us because as, as um, per Escobedo, we can apportion to other factors under quote unquote, under Labor Code Section 4663, natural progression of diseases, pre-existing disability, post-injury disabling events, pathology, which would seem to um, be related to genetics and uh, heredity, and asymptomatic prior conditions and retroactive prophylactic work preclusions. Remember Escobedo, it was the first en banc decision regarding apportionment post SB 899 issued on April 19th, 2005, exactly one year to the passage of SB 899. I'm often see um, the uh, uh, QMEs and PTPs and even AMEs misquoting Escobedo for the proposition that um, there should be no apportionment to asymptomatic prior conditions, but that's exactly the opposite of what Escobedo stood for. So um, if you see in an apportionment discussion a uh, um, discuss, um, reference to a prior uh, injury or illness, but uh, the uh, doctor says that they were asymptomatic prior to the industrial injury, and therefore per Escobedo there is no apportionment, um, make sure you uh, run that back by the, uh, the doctor again and get the correct legal theory applied. Anyway, back to the uh, Rice case, the uh, District Court of Appeals said there's no relevant distinction between allowing apportionment based on a pre-existing congenital or, congenital or pathological condition and allowing apportionment based on pre-existing degenerative conditions caused by heredity or genetic. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about apportionment after Benson. Remember the Benson case, it uh, provided for, uh, it, well, the perfect example of it, um, it allowed for splitting up um, injuries or a permanent disability and allowing for the smaller PD awards to be paid as opposed to one lump sum, which can have big, uh, big uh, impact. Imagine a 100% award versus two 50% awards. Um, there could be a million dollar difference there. That's that's the kind of math that Benson allowed. And um, if you recall, 
the WCAB in this en banc decision said that that's exactly how things were going to work, except in quote unquote limited circumstances. Um, and those limited circumstances have been turned into the quote unquote inextricably interlinked arguments of AMEs, QMEs, and PPPs up and down the state. They've simply said, well, um, I can't apportion out for Benson because the injuries are inextricably interlinked, inextricably linked rather. Well, it's not that simple anymore. Um, we, uh, we have some recent really good case law on that score. First, the Goretzky case. The defense ortho QME, the injured workers um, ortho QME, the defense psych QME, and the injured workers psych PTP, all were able to Benson, uh, provide a Benson apportionment except for the injured workers psych PTP. Um, the, the injured workers, psych PTP said, use those magic words, or supposedly magic words anyway, inextricably interlinked. The WCJ, relying upon the uh, PTP's determination, said, okay, 100%. The WCAB said, no, the PTP's, and I'm going to quote this, apportionment determination is deficient. Rather than articulate the reasoning behind his opinion, the doctor simply concludes, quote, I believe it would be speculated to attempt to offer apportionment of permanent psychiatric disability without speculation or guess. P the PTP, according to the WCAB, does not explain why the apportionment determination made by the other physicians are either incorrect or not applicable. I think this is interesting, uh, particularly the second sentence, rather than articulate the reasoning behind his opinion. Um, in the past, with the inextricably interlinked, the uh, the doctors have, have sidestepped the apportionment determination by saying, I don't know, and, the, and then providing no explanation. Now the onus per the WCAB is on the doctor to come up with an explanation as to why they don't know. So it appears there's actually more work for the doctor to find a uh, inextricably interlinked situation than uh, providing a legitimate apportionment determination. So here's how you do it, according to the Doresky case. Rescind the award and remand to the PTP, in this particular case, could have been a QME or AME, for a supplemental um, or deposition to provide non-conclusory, that's the term of art, reasons for the inability to apportion. Uh, in a similar vein, we have the Cruz case. There are a couple specifics, 2002, 2005, and once again, we have the term inextricably interlinked, this time by an AME. Why an AME? Why an AME? Why an AME? I like quite a number of reasons for really disliking AMEs, not the least of which is AMEs do the worst job on properly applying the AMA guides. QMEs do the second best job, and PTPs actually do um, um, the best job. I've been told by AMEs that they are, their job, they believe, is to split the baby. And if they, for example, properly apply the AMA guides, um, they'll never be agreed to um, by our friends with the California Applicant Securities Association. So just a word to the wise, if you're facing um, a decision as to whether or not to go forward with an AME, um, consider, consider uh, the fact that the doctor is probably going to misapply the AMA guides in a way to your disadvantage. So the judge agreed that the, the AME's inextricably interlinked determination or intertwined determination was correct. And the WCAB panel decision said, again, that's not substantial evidence. You need to remand to provide, obtain a new doctor or for the judge to assign a regular physician, quote unquote. What's a regular physician? It's an independent medical examiner. The labor code used to make reference to independent medical examiners or IMEs. That language has been strict, strip, uh, stricken from the um, uh, labor code and regulations and replaced with regular physician. So the, the judge can assign a regular physician to make the inter, to um, uh, provide the uh, necessary apportionment determination. Let's see what the panel said in Cruz. In the case of successive injuries to the same body part, we held that a combined award of permanent disability is inconsistent with the requirement that apportionment based, be based on causation. The reporting position is required to determine all the causative, sort, the causative sources of the employee's permanent disability, giving consideration not only to the current industrial injury, but also to any prior or subsequent industrial injuries, as well as any prior or subsequent non-industrial conditions. If they cannot do so, they must state why they can't, 
and consult with at least one other physician. Now, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that many, many, many of you have seen these inextricably interlinked arguments coming from AMEs, GMEs, and PTDs. But um, I, I bet them less, less than 1% of the doctors have been consulted with another physician to provide assistance in uh, determ making the apportionment determination. It's just not done out there. And the reason it's not done is because we don't, and by the way, this comes from Labor Code Section 4663. Um, the uh, first of the apportionment statutes, which expressly states that the doctor shall obtain a consultation. So it's up to us. Remember, apportionment, the, the burden of apportionment is on the defense. Uh, so it's up to us to insist that the doctor who claims inextricably interlinked um, consult with a physician. How about the Tapia case? In this case, there's a fire captain with a couple CTs and three specifics. Once again, with the AME, intertwined and found a single CT. The judge agreed. The WCAB panel rescinded and remanded for a supplemental and or deposition. They said, again, this is not substantial evidence. And the doctor, that, that there must be apportionment unless the doctor can state to, to a reasonable medical probability um, and the reasons for saying that apportionment cannot be provided. Notwithstanding the clear evidence that the applicant sustained three distinct injuries, the AME does not assign specific level specific, specific level uh, to the separate injuries or explain why he cannot do so. He simply states, I can I am not able to break out the individual dates and levels of impairment. In short, the onus is upon the doctor to explain why. How about the Ibrahim case? <laughs> this had to be a Southern California, LA County case. 21 claim forms, nine apps, seven specifics, two CTs, and three AMEs. Somebody was just begging for trouble. Two of the AMEs claimed that they couldn't fence and they couldn't provide the apportionment. This too was rescinded and remanded as not substantial evidence because the doctors simply used the term, the term inextricably intertwined in a conclusive, conclusory fashion without explaining why they could not apportion. So don't forget, 46, Labor Code section 4663 and 46624-4 rather require a bench, a bench and apportionment determination except in limited, quote-unquote, quote unquote, limited circumstances. Those are, that is the language from the WCAB en banc decision, Benson. If there are those limited circumstances or the rare instances and the doctor cannot parcel out to the approximate percentage to a re reasonable medical probability, they must have substantial evidence that is non-conclusory. They gotta provide an analysis and reasoning why they can't provide the uh, apportionment and explain why they're unable. The magic words alone, inextricably interlinked, is not substantial evidence. It is not truly, or uh, they are not truly magic words. If they were so, those limited circumstances would be the general rule, which, by the way, has, I believe, been the case ever since the Benson decision. Um, that tide is turning, I believe, given this recent case law. The Beecham case, a significant panel decision, so something that we need to take into further consideration. The panel QME said, get this, in 2018, had the audacity, say, audacity to say the employees Blood markers were abnormally, abnormally, abnormally low for a person with "quote unquote" Negro blood. Obviously, the PQME was removed from the case. It was held that this was impermissible racial or ethnic based um, bias, and this is in direct um, conflict with the uh, California Code of Regulations, which says that all QMEs shall um, um, render opinions without regard to race sex, national origin, religion, or sexual preference. That having been said, don't forget the Viaria case, uh, a third appellate district case that came down quite a while ago. Um, this is, it might have seemed like an ageism case, but it was held otherwise. Take a look at this. We had a 73-year-old woman who bent over to, quote unquote, pick up some brochures, not a box, not a happy, heavy box, but just some brochures, and of, um, suffered from a compression fraction. Now, normally, if a friend of yours tells you they suffered a compression fracture, they, your question is going to be, how many stories did you fall, or how hard was, uh, how big was the truck that ran you over? 
um, this woman was obviously in some way, shape, or form um, um, in a position to suffer from a compression fracture, um, um, particularly um, susceptible. The AME said 64% PD, but a portion to 40% age, ooh, ageism, I don't think we're allowed to do that, and pre-existing osteoporosis, said the AME in deposition. With regards to causation apportionment, it is my opinion that applicant certainly does have risk secondary to the aging process. Uh, again, that sounds like discrimination, illegal, and pre-existing osteopenia and osteoporosis. Together, these two conditions uh, lumped would be responsible for 40% of our current level of permanent disability. Well, my question is, which two conditions are we re re referring to? Aging and osteopenia slash osteoporosis, aging and osteopenia, aging and osteoporosis, osteopenia and osteoporosis. It's just not clear. He proceeded to say in deposition, her age predisposed her to the injury, the osteoporosis, and possibly other factors. You know, put this together, she was pretty much significantly at risk. Well, the question was for the District Court of Appeal, is this a legal apportionment? Is it discrimination on the basis of age or something else? Well, maybe, maybe not was actually the Court of Appeal's um, opinion. They said to the extent that the AME bases apportionment on age, this is in violation of Regulation 11135. They can't reduce a petitioner's uh, permanent disability simply because they're older or male or female or straight or gay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, to the extent that the osteoporosis or some other condition that might contrib contribute to the work-related disability arises or becomes more acute with the age, with age, we see no problem with apportioning PD to that condition. Um, to clarify, so for example, let's say we ask this AME now, if this applicant were um, 25 years old and had the same level of osteopenia osteoporosis at the time of injury, would you provide a similar um, apportionment determination, a similar apportionment figure? If the answer is yes, we're in the clear. We've got legal apportionment. If the doctor says, no, 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 it's because she was older, then we, we do have a problem. In such cases, apportionment is not a, a uh, if we, uh, if it's, if it, uh, if the apportionment is to um, uh, the osteoporosis, in such a process, in situation, apportionment is not to age, but simply to the disabling condition. What if this causes disparate impact? There's some impact right there. What's disparate impact? Well, disparate impact means, for example, that given that, that the osteopenia is suffered by, by older people as a general rule, if we allow apportionment to osteopenia, there's going to be a more apportionment um, for older people suffering from this condition or um, suffering from uh, such, uh, such compression fractures. Is, does that make it discriminatory? And the answer, according to the Court of Appeal, is no. Reducing PD based on a pre-existing condition that is a contributing factor of disability is not discrimination. When the WCAB determines a pre-existing condition contributes to a given disability and apportions accordingly, this is merely a recognition that a portion of the disability exists independent of the industrial injury. So here's the dirty little secret. Such apportionment is not discrimination. Lesson, when a doctor uses the correct language, Apportion to age, no, there's a problem. So um, apportion to condition that happens to be age-related, there's no problem there. Remember, once again, it is the defense's burden to prove apportionment. So if you find the doctor's apportionment to be perhaps illegal or um, suspect and not entirely clear, definitely go back to the physician and ask for clarification, whether in a supplemental report or in deposition. All right. Um, I consider you all friends, and hopefully you don't want to put me out of work, but you can put, give me less work and save some money. Take a look at this one, the Navy case. Um, the defense sought interrogatories. By the way, notice that this was Pleasant Valley State Prison. I can see why they chose interrogatories or questions, written questions, instead of uh, deposition. The judge said, there are other, less cumbersome discovery methods than interrogatories. I can only guess that the judge was referring to, to deposition.
deposition, and I can't imagine a situation in which a deposition would be less cumbersome um, than, than interrogatories, but nevertheless, that was the WCJ's determination. The WCAB was asked, well, should interrogatories be allowed? And the answer was absolutely. It was an error. It was an error not to compel the applicant's response to the defendant's written inquiry. Um, this is a big deal. This could save a lot of time. This could save a lot of money. And defense attorneys, I think, henceforth should be considering um, some submitting um, a number of interrogatories, you know, perhaps at least to get the basic outline um, um, of the, uh, the questions that you want to be answered uh, prior to um, going through the uh, deposition exercise. How far does this logic extend, however? How far um, um, can the interrogatory questions go? Remember that um, the um, Labor Code says that all previous permanent disabilities or physical impairments shall be revealed by folks seeking benefits. Does it really mean all? Remember, the Brit case said that discovery was limited to the body parts at issue. I suspect I, I'm not aware of any case that has um, you know, dealt with this conflict with the law and with the uh, uh, statute and the case law, um, but my guess, I would hazard to guess that the Brit case stands, stands as good law. The Burr decision. This is an interesting one. Um, Labor Code Section 4662 provides the conclusively presumed 100% perm total loss of both eyes, they just automatically get 100%. Uh, it doesn't matter what the, w, what the AMA guides tell us. Similarly, the loss of both hands or use thereof, um, any injury resulting in practically total paralysis, and an injury to the brain resulting in permanent mental incapacity. The question was, what does practically total paralysis mean? This was addressed by the Burr decision. Um, and I'm unaware of any case that would um, had addressed this prior to this 2018 case. Um, the WCAB made clear that the standard would only apply if the injured worker was fu functionally, quote, near quadriplegia, so uh, a quad. Prior to this case, I think it was generally assumed that um, having the applicant stuck in a wheelchair would qualify them for the 100% perm total on labor, under Labor Code Section 4662. That is clearly not the case. The WCAB really emphasized the word total. Of course, that does raise more questions than it answers. What about such conditions as arthritis in the extremities, internal problems, psychological problems? Can these bring the applicant within the uh, paraplegia closer to the practically total paralysis um, standard. We just uh, remains, remains to be clarified, stay tuned. Now, remember, it, at least, now, there's a little proviso here. This is the way it has always been. Um, it's not just about being deemed 100% under Labor Code Section 4662, um, the PERM total um, standards, um, but, for the longest time, we have had case law that said, if your term, term total under Labor Code Section 4662, you receive no apportionment. There has been recent case law that says exactly the opposite. You can receive apportionment even under Labor Code Section 4662. So 4662, 4663, 4664 all provide um, for apportionment. Hallelujah. The Dynamex case, um, um, this, this is a typo, by the way, it's April 20th, 2018, discussed who is and who is not an independent contractor. Remember that an independent contractor is not an employee and therefore would not be covered by workers' compensation. First, they noted that there's a presumption that um, individuals are employees, and that's that's pretty obvious. Um, the independent contractor defense is a defense. It is something that has to be raised by the defense and proven by the defense. But Dynamex came up with an ABC test and said the employer must follow each, must establish each of the following. The worker is free from control and direction of the hiring entity um, and is under contract 
for the work, in fact. The worker performs the work that is outside the general course of the hiring entity's business, and the worker is customarily engaged independently in such a, in such a business. So the question here is, um, is the ABC standard of dynam dynamics um, supposed to overturn the Borello decision, um, a major decision on uh, independent contractor status coming down from 1989? And the answer is, they seem to infer just the opposite. I think it supports the Borello decision, but I don't think it undercuts it in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the Supreme Court in Dynamics listed the Borello factors seemingly in order to consider how to best construct their own ABC test. Um, when you think of independent contractors and whether you've got independent contractor defense, think about it this way. Let's say you're going to build a pool in your backyard. Um, in all likelihood, you are going to be hiring independent contractors. Uh, let's say you um, hired Joe's Pool um, um, Company uh, to build the pool. Um, factors that we look at to determine whether or not uh, Joe is an independent contractor, Joe and his employees are independent contractors, or are, are actually your employees, uh, include the amount of control you have over Joe. Uh, do you tell Joe how to... Um, and presumably, you've never built a pool before, so you're going to rely on Joe to control that. You rely on Joe to do the hiring and firing. Rely on Joe to provide the uh, tools. Provide, rely on Joe to um, decide the hours of his or her um, or his um, workers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you when let's when we go over these factors, um, just think of uh, think of the Joe Joe's pools. The right to discharge at will without cause. Um, that's in reference to you, the alleged employer. Um, um, is if you've got a contract with Joe, you can fire him, well, not fire him, but uh, buy, um, uh, break the contract and just pay damages. It's not a question of firing an employee, whether at will or otherwise. Whether one performing the service is engaged in a distinct occupation or business, clearly Joe would fall in that category. The kind of occupation with reference to whether in the locality the work is usually done under the direction of the principal or by the specialist without supervision. In this case, you're the principal and Joe is the specialist. And presumably, you're not providing any supervision. You just told Joe, you want that pool over in that corner. Have at Joe. Please put it in there. The skill required in the particular occupation, the more um, skill that is required to perform the uh, 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 required task, the more likely you're going to find an independent contractor. For example, if you're hiring somebody who's standing outside of uh, Home Depot uh, with a shovel, uh, in all likelihood, the primary skill they're going to have is a, a strong back. and they are going to be more, much more likely going to be found to be your employee should they be injured than will Joe and his employees. Whether the principal, that's you, or the worker supplies the tools, um, presumably you're not going to be providing Joe with his bulldozer. The length of time for which the services are to be performed, if they're indefinite, far more likely that they're going to be found to be an employee. The method of payment, whether by time or by the job, Presumably, you are going to pay Joe, I don't know how much it is for a pool, $20,000 um, per the contract, and not by the number of hours he works, because otherwise you'll be out there with a time clock, um, making sure that they clock in and clock out. Whether or not the work is part of the regular business of the principal, uh, again, presumably, you don't build pools all around the place. This is Joe's business, and that's why you've hired him. And whether or not the parties believe they're creating a relationship of employer-employee. Um, this is usually a tough one to prove um, um, unless there is some paperwork um, demonstrating um, this belief or lack of belief. So I think the ABC case and um, Borello all make for a troublesome uh, story for folks like Uber who want to argue that their uh, drivers are, in fact, independent contractors. The Eliguia case um, 
Second District Court of Appeal. It's unpublished, but a great read. It deals with, deals with the Fair Employment Housing Act take claims, which is the California's answer to the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, but I think it's applicable to other civil claims as well. Applicants here had a workers' compensation claim and a FIHA claim proceeding at the same time. When the workers' comp claim was settled via this compromise and release, there was an addendum. The addendum said this, this CNR also includes res resolution of all claims arising under any state or federal law or regulation, including California Fair and Employment, Fair Employment and Housing Act, that's the FIHA claim federal and state wage and hour laws, federal and state false claims acts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the question was, is, did this settle the FIHA claim, the CNR settled the FIHA claim? And it was held by the Court of Appeal. Yes, indeed, it, um, it did. The applicant argued that they did not, he didn't understand English. He was never informed that the CNR was releasing the civil claims. And he was actually represented by a different attorney in the FIHA claim at the time the CNR was signed. Nevertheless, the FIHA case disappeared. Said the uh, Court of Appeal, if the parties to the workers' compensation proceeding include in their release an addendum which reflects an intention to reach beyond the workers' compensation, that addendum may be given effect and may encompass FIHA claims. Now, that having been said, number one, I want to um, give a little word to the wise. If for some reason, you're assisting an employer uh, in re, um, losing or getting rid of a FIHA claim by way of a compromise and release, talk to a specialist in this arena. Um, you don't want to be dabbling in, um, in FIHA and other employment claims um, by way of a CNR because um, there is a number, there is a lot of case law providing a lot of particularity as to what is required to successfully erase a FIHA or other civil claim by way of compromise and release. In fact, a CNR typically does not preclude liability for, for uh, uh, specific civil claims. It needs additional and specific, specific language to, to uh, uh, satisfy the civil code. It has to resolve non-industrial claims. And if you don't have that language, it's not gonna be successful. The Camacho case was an example of where an attempt to settle a civil claim by way of a CNR did not work out. The language included was as follows. Um, the CNR would, release, would uh, resolve, quote, any other claims for reimbursement, benefits, damages, or relief of whatever nature. Um, the, C, the problem was the CNR, neither the CNR nor the addendum contained a reference to non-WC claims, uh, especially none by specific and it needs to be clear in non-technical language. Even the size of the print um, will be looked at by the court. Upshot, you're just not gonna sneak the resolution of a civil case, case through um, the, the uh, legal system on a CNR uh, without, um, without uh, dealing with all the ticky tack, uh, ticky tacks. All right, the Morehouse uh, case, another 2018 case. This is fascinating, um, particularly from the defense perspective and overpayments, and I think an experience we've all had previously. There was an overpayment of TD after PNS of $13,000, but the defense underpaid the prior TD award of over $60,000. Now, they did pay VRTD during that period, um, but they underpaid the TD. In fact, they didn't even acknowledge the underpayment until they went to trial and said, we want credit for the overpayment. Let's kick, okay, so let's get this clear, defendant. You want an overpayment credit from monies that accrued as a direct result of your failure to properly pay TD award, TD award? Good luck with that. Well, hold on, that credit was awarded. It was, first off, it was revealed that it was discretionary. And the takeaway was when the facts, now I'm gonna do a little poetry here. When the facts were regarding credit stink, it just might not sink. I'm a poet. Here's what the court said. We do not agree with the WCJ that it would be inequitable to allow the credit. Equity favors the allowance of a credit when the credit is small, apparently $13,000 is considered small, not to me, but to the court, and does not cause a significant interruption of benefits. 
and where the credit for overpayment of one category of benefits is not disruptive. Here, the defendant paid VR during a period when an applicant was ultimately determined to have been TTD. In no circumstance would applicant have been entitled to receive both TTD and VR for the same period for the same injury, although the label may have been different. In effect, there was no significant distinction between the TTD and the VRT um, paid during the same time. So taking the underpayment of the $60,000 to one side, we're still left with a case where there's an overpayment of TD post PNS. I have certainly seen cases where that have gone the other way in that situation. Um, and with the argument that the, the applicant, the poor, poor applicant who received a $16,000 um, um, overpayment would somehow be uh, um, jeopardized or prejudiced by um, receiving, uh, by, by the defense receiving a credit. Now, I can see where that would be true if the overpayment um, um, was in more than the entire award and the defense was trying to argue that applicants should pay back money. But uh, I think this is a very important case to keep in our back pocket. By the way, the commissioners who helped us on this one were Commissioner Lowe and Co Commissioner Zalewski. Uh, the, 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 uh, taking a different view was the Deputy Commissioner Ann Schmitz. The Robles case, uh, if you deal with any um, uh, union employers, this could be very interesting to you. There was a motor vehicle accident on the way to the union office for union business, not for the employer's business, Southern California Gas, but for the union office for union business in the, in the employee's capacity as a union regional manager. You might have noticed that I've, iter I, that I've emphasized the word union three times now going to the union office for union business in its capacity as a union manager. And the question was, the going and coming rule applies, right? The answer was no. And it's a strange, strange uh, logic in my mind. And they said that injuries caused by union activity are compensable, even if it's off the employer's premises, when it's condoned by the employer. Well, the employer has no choice in the matter if he's got a union shop. And there's a benefit to the employer. Well, what, pray tell, is the benefit to the employer? Um, and where does the employer's benefits come from, from uh, union activity? That remains unclear. Um, granted, the employer expressly released, quote unquote, the applicant from his regular work, but that was per the collective bargaining agreement. Didn't have much choice in that matter either. And now, here is, I think, perhaps the biggest problem. The uh, applicant was continued to be paid their regular salary to attend the contract negotiations. Um, thus, these activities were for the quote unquote benefit of the defendant. Here's the interesting language to me. The defendant and the union were in the midst of contentious contract negotiations. The prior contract had already expired. Imminent contract expiration is a factor that may be considered when evaluating if there is a benefit to the employer. Really? Um, I, I don't understand that. Maybe I'm sure smarter people can explain it to me. The Belinda matter. You are IMR. This is an outrageous case. You are an IMR denied uh, the request for authorization for surgery. Applicant nevertheless self-procured and of course then was uh, temporarily disabled. And the PD, as a result of the, of the um, surgery, increased from 7% to 23%. The question was, is the employer liable for PD increase and the TD caused by self-procured treatment that had been denied by utilization review and IMR? And the answer was, holy cow, yes. Unfortunately, the DCA and Supreme Court have denied requests for review of this crazy case. So at least at this point, we are stuck with it, although it is only a panel decision. So we may get other panels to go, go the other way. Um, the question is, how is reasonable and necessary determined? Now, remember, there's only going to be benefits if it's turned, determined to be reasonable and necessary. Our labor code tells us that utilization review and IMR are going to be the sole ways of determining whether something is reasonable and necessary. The only exception to that is when the judge decides that when utilization is review is untimely or in some other way faulty. 
this case seems to be carving out another exception. Apparently, the judge gets to throw out NTUS. And what guidelines should the judge follow if they're throwing out NTUS, throwing, ignoring UR, ignoring IMR? How does the judge determine whether the surgery is reasonable and necessary? In this particular case, the judge said the surgery proved to be reasonable by its positive outcome. Huh? Take a look at this. TD increased from 7% to 23%. I, that's a good outcome. I would hate to see a bad outcome. We're kind of putting the cart before the horse. And had there been a negative outcome, however that might have been defined, would the treatment have been determined to be unreasonable and necessary? Well, suffice to say that if applicants are um, incurring medical treatment that's been denied by UR, IMR, we may be facing a battle with regards to TD um, and or increases in PD. But don't give up hope. Like I said, this is a panel decision and is certainly subject to attack. Can you say, say LaBeouf and is it dead? Remember LaBeouf? I can never spell LaBeouf. I always remembered it by a vowel. Well, here's the Hennessy case. Remember, we had um, prior, to, back in the old days, um, permit disability was based on the diminished ability to compete in the open labor market. Later on, via SB 899, uh, diminished ability to compete in the open labor, open labor market was replaced with diminished future earning capacity. Um, SB 863 for dates of injury on or after 1113 have now uh, removed diminished future earning capacity and now permit disability is solely to be determined based upon the AMA guides, whole person impairment, age and occupation. So and there we go. And that, and that modifier is um, 1.4. I, I'd forgotten to mention that. Permanent disability is now based on the WPI. The modifier 1.4, no matter what body part we're talking about, occupation and age. The question is, does this make VR expert attempts to establish diminished future earning capacity or diminished ability to compete in the open labor market irrelevant and inadmissible? It would seem to, if the only thing we have to worry about is the AMA guides, the, the number 1.4, the applicant's occupation and the applicant's age, what in the world would the voc rehab experts report? Um, what relevance would it have? Well, the problem is the court said no. He said the permanent disability rating schedule is still only prima facie evidence and VR reports can be used to argue for more or less PD. This too makes no sense to me. Um, I agree that the PDRS, the Permanent Disability Rating Schedule, is still only prima facie evidence of PD, but that doesn't mean um, that we need a VR expert to um, provide more or less permanent disability. Remember, we still have Guzman, and the doctor can um, Guzman us um, in using the AMA guides. By the way, do we pay all expert opinion for all ex all expert um, opinions from VR? Uh, VR experts, heck no, object, object, object. Uh, the bills um, for VR experts, quote unquote, may, for the labor code, be permitted. It's not mandatory, it's not a shall. And whether a VR expert report is uh, reimbursable, follows the same rules of uh, reimbursement for medical legals, is it reasonably, necessarily, and actually incurred? The beat pull, uh, pull list case uh, versus California Correctional Healthcare. We got a QME. This is an interesting case. QME panel, two were stricken, leaving uh, one Dr. E. The, the notice indicated uh, via telemedicine, evaluation will take place through the use of telehealth using interactive audio, video, and data communications. According to the panel, the QME was permitted to conduct examinations via telemedicine as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Uh, the WCAB fails to identify who permitted this accommodation, and there was an article in WorkCom Central about this particular case, um, and that information was also um, missing, as was the disability in question. The QME, here's, here's how it worked. Quote, the QME was on live screen. Uh, the applicant spoke with him directly, and a chiropractor was present in person with the applicant in the exam room. The QME did all the talking. He walked her through everything. 
The chiropractor, the chiropractor also explained his training. He did everything in the manner in a manner that the QME could watch. He did things such as check range of motion, grip strength, and other things. The QME watched all of this. Applicant indicated she was familiar with tele, the telemedic evidence or telemedic um, telemedicine, and she thought the examination was much more thorough than a regular exam. Um, at the MS. The, the defense re, uh, failed to object to this telemedicine QME um, until the MSC, and the question became, is this report admissible? And it was held, no, it's not. A replacement panel was issued. Um, but it doesn't appear that the problem was that it was telemedicine. It was only that it was the only argument that the panel said against using this report was fairness and due process because the employer did not get notification that it was going to be a telemedicine examination um, prior to the examination actually taking place. So it appears that telemedicine may actually have a future. The DC did not sign the report or issue any other verification that would establish the reliability of the measure, DC measurements. Uh, consequently, since the defendant had no prior notice of the QME's intention to use an DS, DC as a surrogate, it was not provided um, adequate opportunity to object to the use of the prior issuance of the report. Um, it was unfair, and uh, next another panel issued. So, does this mean the future of QME evaluations can be done via um, telemedicine for out-of-state or Eureka-based, for example, applicants? Stay tuned, but it certainly does seem to be the case, as long as all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, that is, as long as the uh, parties are made aware prior to the invest uh, prior to the uh, evaluation that telemedicine will be utilized and the evaluator who is there in person is revealed and his or her qualifications are all provided to the party the shy case another ame a portion 50 percent that's kind of nice of the CT of the low back to non-industrial, quote unquote, pre-existing genetically determined degenerative disease, DDD, degenerative disc disease. The judge said, not substantial. The WCAB said, oh, yes, it is. Post SB 899, since April 19th of 2004, we apportioned a pathology, asymptomatic preconditions, genetic and heredity factors. Remember, this is what we went over when we talked about Escobedo earlier. So. We can apportion to degenerative disc disease, and clearly, in this case, in the spine. Do you have an applicant who's over 50 years old who has degenerative disc disease? Almost everybody over the age of 50 has degenerative disc disease. How do I know that? That's in a footnote in your AMA Guides, 5th edition. So if you've got an file involving a bad back with somebody over the age of 50, and I suspect you've got at least a dozen of them, you should be thinking about apportionment under the SKY decision. All right, it used to be so much easier. Can the WCAB make it any more cumbersome and expensive to get rid of um, silly cases? Here's the Stout case. Uh, it was on the court's calendar six times and good old applicant never appeared once. A notice of intention to dismiss the claim that, um, issued, uh, but applicant's counsel objective objected and based on that objection the panel said there there goes the notice of intention to dismiss we can't get rid of the case yet it says that it, they reminded us of labor code section 5700 says any party may be represented by an attorney well applicant's attorney was there at those six at those six appearances and rule 10301 defines hearing is, well, just about anything that happens down at the board, an MSC, writing MSC, status conference, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we can't just get a notice of intention dismissed and wait for somebody to object, and then if they don't object, have it dismissed, something I did literally hundreds of times when I practiced down in Southern California, at least well, 20 years ago now. Um, now we have to subpoena the employee, and if there are no show, at that point, we request an order of contempt and or sanctions and or an order compelling applicant to appear. If they still fail to appear, I think our only option is to proceed to trial on the merits. Now, without an applicant there, you can probably admit that we're gonna win that one, but sadly, we're gonna lose for, uh, lose for winning because um, the WCIB has just provided um, a great deal more time and expense 
in getting rid of these these silly claims. All right. Well, anybody got the munchies? Let's talk about a, a little bit about marijuana. We've got a few minutes left, and uh, you may have wondered ever since medicine, uh, marijuana became legal for fun and profit, and actually even before that for medical uh, reasons, um, are, is Utilization Review and uh, IMR going to approve it? Approve it, and thus far, uh, according to the IMR decisions that have been published on the web, the answer is an emphatic no. Here's a case, like a, a one case that I just found on the on the web. The applicant had CRPS. Uh oh, that means a lot of money. Chronic pain syndrome, uh, lumbar radiculopathy, lumbar fusion, severe pain, nine out of a ten. Get this: Percocet, Anaprox, Pro, uh, Prilosec, and CB, CBD. And the question was, can we get rid of some of these medications and toke on the doc on the employer's dime? And the answer was an emphatic, absolutely not. What are you smoking? Buy your own stash. And they gave some reasons in this IMR decision. There are no quality studies supporting cannabis use. Well, that's because the federal government has precluded quality studies from occurring, or at least has dramatically cut, curtailed and cut back on that um, proceeding. So you, you don't expect any quality studies of any significance coming down the pike anytime soon. There are serious risks to marijuana. It was a, it was said because uh, it it's associated with uh, cognitive declines and cognitive performance. I thought that was the reason for smoking marijuana. More studies are needed. In short, don't expect to light up soon, anytime soon, at least on the employer or insurance carrier's dime. Multiple decisions um, with similar results. Um, they do make reference, a lot of them make reference to the NTUS, which refers again to the decrease in con cognitive performance. And I found this interesting, the possibility of psychotic symptoms, symptoms in vulnerable persons from the use of marijuana. I've never seen that. Of course, I've never uh, in, um, involved myself in marijuana and certainly don't know anybody who ever has. But um, nevertheless, had I, I would still be able to say I've never seen anybody have psychotic problems from marijuana. Um, nevertheless, that's what our friends at the IMR uh, at, at IMR are, are telling us. Um, just a couple more cases, medical, treat, medical treatment uh, stipulations. Be careful with those stipulations. In this pain case, which is an appropriate name for it, the stipulation settling the case for all practical purposes kept future medical treatment open and said that the applicant's medical treatment issues would be referred to but to the AME. Um, a dispute arose and the defense said, well, wait, wait a minute, there's been a legislative change. We now require a request for authorization, utilization review of IMR. That's going to preclude the AME making the treatment decision. And it was held, no, that's not the case at all. The stipulations will trump the statutory change. Um, high volume of IMR cases are expected to continue. We continue to get lots of IMR decisions. The confirmation rate um, of IMR, confirmation of utilization review by IMR is almost 92%. Just a couple other thoughts. CTs are if you're, are you seeing more CTs? I have a whole PowerPoint presentation on CTs. It is on our website. Please feel free to take a look at that. Um, the, the statistics are scary. 91% of CT and loss uh, time places involve a, an applicant's attorney. How often is that? About twice the, twice the amount of time that uh, attorney involvement for the rate of all other claims. 80% of medical only CT cases involve applicants' attorneys, which is four times that of for, for more, spe for more specifics. Um, there, the CTs are dramatically increasing pure premium rates. Uh, with, were it not for, pre, uh, for CTs, the pure premium rate would have been for January 1, 2018, $1.59. In 10, it's a 23% increase to $1.96. Nothing new. We've clearly got a problem, according to the Workers' Compensation Action Network. Um, in dealing with CTs, the, one of the pivotal places in the case is going to be the deposition and trying to prove that the applicant knew um, about the, the industrial injury um, uh, pre-termination. But there's also some consideration that we have to uh, consider um, 
given this Lockton report that just issued. They said 67% of denied claims convert to paid claims within a year. Denying then approving claims actually increases costs 55% over claims paid without first getting denied. Claims denied and then paid uh, cost almost $16,000 on average, while claims accepted and paid cost uh, just over $10,000. Quite a bombshell. Um, not recommending that means you um, admit or claim, um, um, accept all the claims that come down the pike, but these are some facts and figures that you might want to include in your analysis um, as to whether a claim should be accepted. Um, we've got some more information about um, the uh, um, uh, the commissioners. We've been missing some com commissioners. Um, we still are missing one, but um, we've got a couple new ones. Uh, Juan Pedro Gaffney, who is 80 years old, was um, picked by the governor. This is a governor a governor appointed position. His qualifications: 40 years of directing folk music chorus. I'm not quite sure how that uh, qualifies him, but he's also the governor's high school friend from back in 1955. I suspect that, that might explain this decision a little bit more. He was honest uh, when he was quoted in the San Francisco Chronicle. What should I do? Should I not plead guilty? Yeah, I'm a friend of Jerry's. We go way back. Jerry knew me when I was active in social action and politics. He didn't forget that part of me. Well, in, Jer in, Jerry governor, in the Jerry governor's defense, there must be five attorneys, two of the of seven commissioners, and 10 uh, may be non-attorneys. Um, reading the tea leaves, I think this commissioner is cut from, a, from, cut, cut from cause cloth and probably will be ruling against the defense far often than we're happy with. Another quote um, from Gaffney, I never lost interest not just in labor and workers' rights, but in social justice for all, for societal well-being, and for the common good. Um, I consider it both an opportunity and challenge to work assiduously at this, um, and I will aim it to be as fair and equitable in assessing the merits of claims from any side that comes. At the same time, I know where I come from. I think these are words to be considered uh, when evaluating how he's likely to roll. Um, additionally, Catherine Dodd was just assigned. She was confirmed by the full Senate without even being any asked any questions. She, I think, is perhaps going to be a more um, even-handed. Her daddy is a, um, a senator, and she worked for the ACLU, but she also worked for corporate from 2016 and 2017. So hopefully she'll be a little more um, even-handed than uh, some that we uh, are dealing with. She is a baby. Uh, she became an attorney in May of 2017 or uh, 15. So, so much for her um, experience. She'll be learning on the job. Um, we have more, but I think we're 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 going to have to be done for, done for the day. And I'm going to put uh, Tammy on. And I want to thank you very much for attending today. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Please click the link to the training certificate request in the description below. You may need to hit the show more button to see the entire description and find the link. Fill out the training certificate request and a certificate will be issued via email within five business days. If you are having trouble accessing the certificate request form, please email certificates at bradfordbarthel.com with the date you viewed the video and a certificate will be issued manually. Again, that's certificates at bradfordbarthel.com. Thank you.